Okay. Hi, everyone. So, thank you all for being here. It's so good to see everyone uh, in person, online. Um, this week's discussion is about qi or qi flow in our bodies during meditation. And there's a lot to talk about here, especially since much of what I am going to be covering is, again, very foreign. I seem to be doing a lot of these conversations. Um, let's see. Uh, but uh, it brings up a lot of questions like, what is key? Um, that's a good question. We, we don't have a good translation. We don't have a really good understanding. Um, there is no cultural context for it. However, it is embedded within uh, an Asian and especially East Asian cultural perspective. I wanted to discuss key as a way to shed light on various elements of what we uh, what we do or what we say in the hondo when it comes to our meditation and to emphasize aspects of our practice in relation to uh, what is actually happening in our bodies during meditation. Why is there so much emphasis on breath and posture? Why do we always massage certain points at the end of our meditation? Uh, what is all that om ah hum thing about? And my argument here is to demonstrate how uh, this energy flow helps to understand uh, these and many other questions, uh, other similar questions. And this in turn will help us be more aware of our own energy system and, and how, they Im how it impacts our daily life. And if you couldn't tell, uh, I will out myself. I firmly and strongly believe in key. I, I trust it, I have faith in it, I work with it, um, and, and, and therefore it influences much of how I relate to the world, how I see things going on around me. And I've had direct experiences that confirm for me that this energy flow stuff is real. A lot of it comes out of my professional training, yes, but also from my Buddhist practices over the last 20 years. But it still may seem like mumbo-jumbo. And I get that, and that's okay. Um, the, the energy that I'll, be, uh, that I'll be talking about has not been able to be measured by modern methods necessarily as of yet, which causes a lot of skepticism. I get it. However, I want to remind you of my recent talk on Dharani, the, the kind of verbal incantations, just because it's foreign and that we don't have much of a cultural perspective for it, doesn't mean it's not valid, or that it's not true. So let's get into it. Um, qi, qi, or qi, spelled in two different ways, the pinyin versus the wave giles, are both the same thing. In Japanese and qi, uh, my training as an acupuncturist was qi, but we're a Japanese school, so we use qi. But what it is, trying to actually define what key is, um, is an endeavor. It's really tough. Uh, there are entire books written on the concept. Uh, to say nothing of as a concept, it's changed and evolved and been associated with other concepts to make much more deep, profound meaning. And <clears throat> as we uh, look at this character, the, it, it, the character itself, uh, key has changed a lot over time. Um, it, it originally, in, in ancient Chinese, it was just three simple lines. Over time, it changed and became kind of what we'll, we'll, we can use this one as most commonly used to look at uh, this particular definition. And the radical on the top uh, is, in top and right side, is that of air or gas. And the other underneath to the um, underneath to the left, is that a price? This makes maybe a little, uh, maybe a little sense, but you have to also recognize how much rice meant in the Chinese and Japanese culture and history. Okay? It's an essential food. It's a giver of life. It's sustenance. And so the air that comes off of that rice I mean, sure, it's steam, but don't, don't think of it as moisture, that moisture. It's really the, the, the essence of rice without a physical form. That's the kind of imagery that we're thinking about. 
So we might say that qi is an essence that gives and sustains life. And we here translate that as energy. Kind of broad. But it's also life force or a motive force. But as usual, we have no concept of it and therefore no good translation that compares. The early concepts of this energy stuff predate Buddhism. In early India, the Indic systems had these types of concepts. Think about traditional yoga, the chakra system, etc. These concepts were adapted and developed as Buddhism developed and spread. And then in China, before Buddhism was even introduced, Taoist mystics were conceiving of this type of energy idea for centuries before the turn of the Common Era. It, in turn, influenced the development of uh, Chinese medicine, acupuncture, qigong, tai chi, feng shui, the martial arts, numerology, cosmology, etc., etc. And, and it's this, uh, and it's at this point in the discussion that I, ha I have to, it, it's problematic for me, because there is a lot of Indic and Taoist history that obviously influenced Buddhism, and, and vice versa. But I'm going to need to attempt to try to figure out a way to discuss things in a Buddhist-specific context. There is a lot of overlap when it comes to um, when it comes to these perspectives on energy. It is hard to sometimes differentiate between what is what or which is which. Is this an Indic system? Is this Taoist system? Is this wholly Buddhist? In fact. Um, and, and since this discussion on, is on key specifically, I have to admit that much of it does relate back to Taoist origins. Um, um, oh, sorry, thank you. Um, so these da in these Taoist in origins, but th that shouldn't distract from the fact that um, Buddhist uh, it, Buddhism did adopt these concepts. In fact, many of the Chan, what would later become Zen, um, the meditation schools in early China, were heavily influenced by Taoism. In the same way, Chan meditation greatly influenced Taoism. Many Chan practitioners were Taoists or came from Taoist backgrounds. So to say that there's exclusively a Buddhist definition of Qi would be misleading. We cannot untangle the influences of each. They are intrinsically entwined. There is a lot that is Taoist that is not Buddhist. But the idea that there is an energy that flows in our body and in our world around us was already part of the Buddhist conception from its Indic roots. Then, with Buddhism's arrival in China, turn of common era, this concept was appropriated translated, culturally influenced, and developed into the future. So, yeah, that's a small glimpse of what key is. Um, but really, how does this play out? If we, if we start to understand that key is all around us, it is the basic building block um, within a a Chinese perspective. It includes the mind and body, heart, spirit, and everything else that surrounds it. Qi can have different qualities, but Qi is Qi. Energy is energy. That same Qi that flows uh, around flows through mind and body alike. So any problems with the flow of Qi, and there's a a problem in both mind and body simultaneously. If the key is stuck, for example, stagnancy, stiffness, and tension can prevail. But this tension is heart, mind, body. Enter. Sorry, thank you. Heart, mind, body. And, and can extend to our physical space. Physical tightness, aches, and pains can be experienced as well as mental tension, as frustration, 
stress and anxiety. Maybe it's the pile of clothes that never gets, no, in my case, it's the entire room that never gets picked up. Uh, and, it, and it stays stagnant. And it gets stuck. And it's just harder to clean at that point. If there's not a proper smooth flow of key, our body, our breath, mind, have a hard, harder time to settle. Why do you think all those monks ran off to the mountains? We were just talking about sacred mountains. It, yeah, okay, isolation, yes, that, that does help. Taking stimulus away, you know, being able to be in nature, to start to attune and align oneself to that energy flow, to start to kind of get into sync with nature's natural circadian rhythm of the seasons. Their space was sparse and clean, like their thoughts. There, there wasn't a cluttered, noisy mess. That would be a different energy. Like when they descended off the mountain and would go to the town square. Very different space. Very different energy. Tai Chi can be like this, as an example. These groups of people um, in the park moving around in a particular fashion, gracefully and fluidly. They're ensuring the smooth and even flow of qi, qi throughout their body. If it flows smoothly, no pathology, no illness. We're both mentally and physically flexible and calm. This is how acupuncture um, defines health. It's this smooth and even flow of qi throughout the body. There's a balance. Think equanimity. For our meditation, this key flow is in direct relationship with our breath and posture. Our heart, mind, body reflect the state of our key. However, our key can be influenced by our heart, mind, body. Think about when you get stiff. What do you do? You get up, you move around, you stretch, you gotta get things moving again. Yeah. You're moving the chi. When, <clears throat> or when you can't stop, stop the rebel thinking in your head, we can sigh, we can try to drop our shoulders, relax the tension, maybe even shake off physically, right? Helping our minds to clear the muck, as it were, to physically decompress, to feel less tight so that our mind can follow. When it comes to our meditation, having an idea that there is an energy flow can help focus and direct one's attention during that meditation. Along with counting the breath, we can imagine the energy flowing in a certain way around our body and use that as a focal point of our concentration. If we encourage a smooth flow, our body will relax, our mind will become quieter. Our attention activates the chi, and our intention directs it. With this kind of awareness and intentionality, we can also gain strength and vitality. We can move aches and pains, or relieve anxieties and anger. And, and I hope this helps to explain why breath and posture are often cited as crucial aspects for deeper meditative states. And I'll try to explain more in a bit, but because it's not to say that it's impossible to get to those deeper states, it just, it's a little harder. In meditation, he can flow in an inscribed way. When uh, we gain our energy daily, from the food that we eat and the air that we breathe, particularly. We bring qi into our bodies with every breath. Ichishina Sensei talks about how particularly important the breath is during meditation. 
our lungs are a partial vacuum. So we when so the breath in happens naturally after we push the breath out. We don't have to work to draw that air in per se. It comes in to a point. That drawing in of air brings vitality to the body. We need oxygen. And there's also key. As we sit in meditation, we breathe in softly, gently. It comes into our nose, down the tongue. This is why we put our tongue behind our upper front teeth. It comes into our nose, down the tongue, through this hard palate. And I should say as an aside here, if you find your teeth are touching up and down, open them up, relax the jaw. The rest of the tongue should not be plastered to the roof of your mouth, just the tip. Let it fall and hang into the jaw. If you have a hard time, if you often clench um, or like grind, as you put the tip of your tongue behind your teeth, widen your tongue and put just a little bit between the upper and lower molder, molars. I guarantee you, you're not going to clench up after that. <laughs> In that dropping of the tongue, it allows saliva to roll to the back of the mouth. And then we're not having to swallow as often. But the energy comes in through the mouth, down the tongue, down the front, through the esophagus, down the front of our bodies, and <clears throat> it travels past the hard palate, down the throat, into our lungs. Now, in, as the lungs fill, we also have to think about how we often draw that belly, that belly breath down. We're using our diaphragm. And in that, as we seemingly fill and empty our bellies as we breathe, that's drawing that energy down past the solar plexus, which is kind of the upper notch of the rib cage in the front, down the solar plexus, and, and finally down into our pelvic bowl or our tanden. And I'll come back to that part in just a bit. Uh, you, uh, this is because, but this is where this tanden, as you see in the bottom here, is, is where that energy is no longer just air key, but it becomes. I don't know, us key, key that we can use. It mixes in the tanden and circulates there. Then with the breath out, that key rises along the spine. Th this we might call our upright key. It brings the warmth of that tanden up the body and strengthens and holds the spine. It continues up the back part of the body, up the neck and around the top of the head back across, down to the nose, and back to the hard palate and the frenulum. The, the energy can also actually come out of the top of the head, at the topmost point. And um, this is what you see at the, t the top in the description there is called Bai Hui. This is the acupuncture and point uh, name of this point. Um, the Hui is a, a meetings or a, um, convergence, and Bai is hundreds. So it's a, a place of hundred convergences. And it's actually the suture of four main plates of your skull. Um, if, if you can feel, you, you have the whorl of hair, um, and right in front of that whorl of hair, you'll feel a little bump. That is the suture of two main plates. Come right in front of that little bump, and that's by Hui, that little kind of soft, tender, topmost part, right? And Shumon Sensei always uses this, this point to describe how to suspend yourself. And as we start our meditation, we, she says, suspend yourself from a string. That's, that's, from, that's the marionette point, right? Um, so it can also come and up out of that point. And, um, and it's, it's, it kind of splits the hemispheres of the skull. So uh, left to right and front to back. It should be directly over... Um, the tips of the ears, which should be directly over shoulders, supposedly. Um, <clears throat> this energetic exit is seen as our connection to heaven, or the divine in Taoist perspective, and plays a part in the energy behind why, in so much Buddhist imagery, uh, it, it has a part in the description of how we get that bump on the Buddha's head. Um, and... <laughs> For me personally, I've actually seen this happen. Uh, and if you pay close attention to many monks, you'll see this phenomenon. 
Um, but I'll, I'll I diverge for just a quick second because um, this is uh, Horisawa Sensei, uh, Horisawa Solomon Sensei. Um, and I'm sorry for the quality of the picture, but Horisawa Sensei is an accomplished meditation practitioner, practitioner Tendai practitioner. Um, he's written uh, introduction manuals to meditation in Japanese. Each Shima Sensei is actually translated it into English. Um, and, and I have to say, he's one that comes to, I think of when we were at um, the 40th um, anniversary of the um, the Jigyodan, the Overseas Char Charitable Foundation. We were having an international symposium. Um, so Sangha leaders, uh, Tendai Sangha leaders were coming from all over the world to describe what they do at their temples. And many, especially from the, the Sangha and the North America in general, we bring up a lot of meditation because that's what y'all like to do. So we, a lot of Sangha leaders talked about, yes, we provide meditation for our Sangha members. And Hori Sawa Sensei had to make sure he stood up and said, now wait, what are you teaching? What meditation are you doing? Is it Shikan? Is it Ju Yi Sai Cho like Shikan? Because if not, then you're not doing Tendai. Luckily, that's what we teach, right? But this, this is quality. He, he, find, you know, he would be considered a Dai Jari? A Jari? Dai He's a doctor. Dai he did a 12-year um, hell, hell practice, mm -hmm. meditation practice. Yeah. Um, and, and so on the same level of Ichishima Sensei in scholarship, but in meditation. I mean, okay, so I digress, but and you can clearly see <laughs> that there is the mound. And in his manual of meditation, I found it interesting. He uses a lot of imagery, and particularly um, around the rising and descending of energy in our body, and along and in synchrony with our breath. And so one of them describes like an elevator shaft, or an elevator within an elevator shaft, right? He actually has one like a rocket ship. You, you, you're imagining it coming up out of your head. So, I mean, this, for me at least, it, it gives me an example of how our bodies can actually change based on movement of energy in our body. Okay, I digress. There's also energy coming up from the earth, uh, entering through our feet. Or, uh, and or our perineum, which is the space between our genitals and, and anus. And, and as an aside, this again, Taoist explanation, but this is the more earthy yin energy, as opposed to the heavenly uh, yang energy from above and that we're breathing in through our nose. And so we, uh, we are, humans are, between heaven and earth from a Taoist perspective. Now, I bring up this kind of top and bottom idea because... This is why we massage our body the way that we do after our meditation. We have opened ourselves up. We, draw, we have drawn energy in. So we massage to help to kind of close and or dis distribute that energy throughout the body. As we come out of the stillness that is our meditation, we massage the crown of our head along the midline, kneading the suture of the skull and closing that by way. And the same is the soles of our feet, especially for those who are um, standing or sitting in chairs. And, and also why we put an emphasis on keeping your feet flat on the floor. Energy is being drawn up through the feet. And you can see some of that on the figure on the left here. And I wanted to provide these images at least to offer possible ideas of focus and concentration. Much like an image uh, on the handout, there are points uh, along this kind of circular trajectory. Now, especially along the front, you might uh, associate these with the chakras. Oh, okay. Um, and then and, and along the back, I want to particularly point out, um, it's where our, our spine curves. Our spine should be a column. And yet, in this column, there is a natural wave of a, a convex and concave curves. These points, especially along the ones on the right, side, the right side picture, are at those transition points of where it goes convex to concave. Mm. And in those transition points, it's either exaggerated, <laughs> right? Or it gets unbalanced and it can get key, key and the, in, around these energetic centers can get stuck. So, um, 
these transition points during a meditation, if we can, if the key moves, these areas can be open, dredged, strengthened. But that drawing in of breath has to reach the belly in order to make a circular movement of the energy. If we're slouched, we can't draw in a deep breath. In that slouched position, our belly caves, our, our rib cage falls forward, our shoulders roll forward, right? Our lungs cave, our neck is bent so we can still see up, <laughs> right? In general, we're a kink toes. How would water run fluidly through bends like that? Therefore, to have that natural inhale of that vital breath, as Ichishima Sensei might describe, it's got to be, it's got to be able to come in easily. If that pathway is obstructed, we bring in less key. If key is meant to flow in our body and give root to our consciousness, then how it flows impacts not just body, but also heart-mind. Remember, there is no difference between heart-mind and body. They are tied to each other. If there is tension in one, there's going to be tension in the other. This becomes the basis for why posture in, in our meditation is so important. The reason there is, the, the reason there is so much emphasis on, on how we sit is because if we sit with tension, our minds will not settle. If you imagine how much energy you have to use in order to hold your head in this position, all these muscles are preventing you from flopping your head because your head, as a bowling ball as it is, is not sitting on a column. So if, if you're having to you waste your energy holding, holding, it, it, it becomes a distraction. And because our tension calls attention to itself. So <clears throat> then if we can't establish this column to be able to stack this bowling ball, we, we need to start at a foundation. If the foundation is weak, then the rest of the column will not have that upright key that keeps it straight. So why am I drawing this? Is, why am I bringing this up? Is because the tandem, tandem. Uh, again, what is that? Now I told you I was going to come back to it. Here it is. Um, there are three main seas of chi, uh, fields of chi, uh, key, uh, energy. There, the, the tanden, there's uh, upper, middle, and lower tanden. We particularly focus on the lower, and, um, especially because it becomes the basis of why our posture is so important. So you probably heard Mochin Sensei mention the tanden. It's the space within our pelvic bowl, um, inside our pelvic bone. Two finger breaths are just below the, the belly button. Think about the like waistband or belt line. Right, and it's also to the level of our lower lumbar and sacrum in the back, and then down to the perineum, down to the genital region. So in those three points, it creates a ball, a bowl type um, image. And um, this form, this pelvic bowl becomes our center of gravity, our central pivot, our axis. And the image here depicts it uh, um, as well. It, it's like it, it's, it has it as a fire in the, in the belly. And yeah, in acupuncture, we call it a ministerial fire. It, it governs, you know? And <laughs> because maybe it's your gut feeling. Maybe uh, your willpower. Or your drive. Your gumption. Your chutzpah. Yeah. Don't ask how I wrote that on my paper, by the way. Um, because in, like in martial arts, those who have done it know what I'm talking about. 
it's it from this ton then is where all those movements come from. It, it it's the center of from which those things sit and hit horse stance for hours. Like just that's fun. Um and because that fire needs fueling. And if we look closely at the image, uh, also on your handout, the point in the back is Ming Men. This is translated as the gate of vitality, gate of life. Uh, if you want to be specific, it's, it's below the spinous process of uh, the second lumbar vertebra, as if you care. Um, and, and so it's in that low back. And, that it, and it's between the two kidneys. This gets into a little too much into acupuncture, but the kidneys house your prenatal chi, like what you're given to, to you by your parents. It's like your, your yin and yang are housed in your kidneys, and they come together to form the gate of life in Tandel. Okay? okay. So <clears throat> that's Ming Men. Um, and so when we're, when we're doing this at the end of meditation, this is what we're doing. We're warming our kidneys as we kind of invigorate the lower portion of our tandem. Okay? The one, the point in the front, chi high, down in the lower belly, this is a, a sea of chi. This is a sea of chi. So, um, again, much in line with the kind of idea of what uh, of the tandem. And um, then at the bottom, hui yin, hui yin, it, like bai hui, Hui is a convergence or the meeting, and the meeting of all yin. And for anyone who's been kicked there, it's certainly a convergence of something. Um, but, but the names of these access points um, to the Tanden can demonstrate the importance of this area in general. Imagine from that lower belly being able to come and pull up, uh, pull, I should say, pull down the uh, vital breath instead of just <gasps> drawing it in. If you can imagine drawing down that breath, otherwise that flame down at the bottom goes out or at least suffocates and smolders, which leaves your cauldron metabolism above it not functioning as well. Now, now all of a sudden your energy wanes. You start dragging and are less motivated and no drive. So the ton then becomes the engine house where all that key you bring in from air and food and etc. starts to mix and becomes key that you can use. In so doing, the ton then becomes our field of key and a center of energy that fuels and puts into motion all of our basic functions. It also grounds us and provides us a stable foundation. And that energy rises up through the spine, spreading through the nerves, supporting and nourishing, coming up into head to clear the mind, support the brain function, etc. But we often weaken our tandem by overconsuming, overdoing, overexerting, over over anything. Extremes can be taxing. We talk about the middle way a lot, but it, yeah, it, extremes can rock our foundation. I mean, like we think about going on vacation. Oh, get to let go, relax. Man, that feels great. But how long does it take for you to get back into rhythm, to get back on your schedule, to feel like a homeostatic state again? That takes energy, right? In the same way that you might have a presentation that you have to do on a certain evening and it has a deadline. And, you know, so you know that it's a stressful period. It takes a lot of effort. That's going to rock your foundation. It's like a, it swings you off your pendulum gets you off that neutral basic line. It takes energy to come back and become rested after such an exertive, stressful time. Kind of makes sense. And uh, let's see, where did I get to? So 
if we can bring about some sort of alignment, some sort of neutral, we can keep a, a, a sense of homeostasis because that's what our body naturally wants. But you know, life happens, right? So we get rocked. And if, if we can get an alignment, then all is aligned. Again, if our heart, mind, body is one, then if we're aligning that key, our thoughts, our emotions, our intentions, our physical body, or all, as Maxime would put it, purified. Because in balance, they're, because they're in balance, not in excess. That strong foundation, that strong drive, leads to the type of kishanti, or patience, forbearance, that Kainan was talking about just a couple of weeks ago. I mean, look at the image. We have all these elements in us, and those elements can be um, uh, associated with the five Buddhist chakras. Uh, chakras in Buddhism only are only five. Um, in Indic systems, there are seven. Uh, just as an aside, they combine these two, the top and, and, um, and third eye, together into one. And also the root and um, uh, core chakra into one as kind of a more pelvic bowl than tanden type of chakra. So just five. Um, <clears throat> and if you look at the image, there, it, these elements are in us and are arranged in accordance to their energetic systems. And yeah, chakras. Key plays a role in how all these elements are kept in balance. And I hope, to, uh, I hope you have all noticed how Shimon Sensei, being the energizer bunny, bunny that she is, um, is driven because she's got a focused drive. Got her chutzpah about her. And, and that drive to provide for all of us. But she needs to feed that fire. She needs to feed that drive to recenter, a refuel, because even she can't pour from an empty cup. Because keeping that foundation strong is incredibly impactful. So we have to start paying attention. If, if we could notice how our fidgets in meditation are just a manifestation of an unsettled, frenetic, key. Then we can take a deep breath, drawing, it, drawing that breath down, and recentering. As we breathe out, we let go of our tension, allow our shoulders to not be earrings, and generally decompress. Our muscles then start to relax, and that nervous, pent-up feeling is hopefully getting a, like less slightly, or smoothed over, presumably. But before all that, first and foremost, we have to start noticing how we are, being aware of what's going on. Uh, I tell patients that that awareness of noticing your pain uh, or discontentedness is three-fourths of the battle. When we can notice, we have the ability to choose, choose to do something or not. But we cannot help influence our own key without first being aware of it. When we notice that we may be really tight in the shoulders, we choose to relax them. We overthink or ruminate or worry. We bring our attention to our breath. We direct our focus to something more here and now. And as we start to notice our current state, we also notice how to learn to improve that state. Being able to actively direct key can promote better key circulation. As it smooths and settles, so does the heart and body. But noticing the qualities of the key can help profoundly. And it helps, it really helps, it comes down to how and what we are feeling. You feel hot, blow off the steam, probably out of the top of your head, right? Maybe after your meditation, you have a visceral scream in a soundproof closet. I don't know. I'm going to bless your boat. Is, is, is there a lot of energy up in your head? 
Maybe it's sinus pressure, high blood pressure, tension, a headache, overthinking, worry, rage. Okay, if it's too up, we need to bring that energy back down out of the head. So we then we relax our shoulders. We put most of our focus in our feet or go touch grass or focus on the tanden. We breathe down into them to help anchor the too much up. Soreness in meditation is going to happen. And there's a difference here between pain and pain. Maybe, maybe I'm talking about aches during meditation. Because I'm not encouraging anyone to sit through their pain. It's not. Um, and, and, and I'm also not saying that you're going to be able to cure your pain. Okay. Yes. Oh, is it time? Okay, so sorry. Um, re remember, dukkha prevails. I mean, this, it, you know, pain's going to be there. But you can ease it, reflect on it, and have a different reaction to it. Perceive it differently. Much of what we experience of our pain is actually the pain of pain. The dukkha of our dukkha. Oh, man, my damn pain. All right? If it wasn't for this pain, and the guarding of our pain, the protecting, it only begets more tension. So instead, okay, pain, I see you. Let's try to move you, because I don't like you. But let's do it actively, intentionally, and purposefully. Okay. Since we need, we're going to be finishing up, um, we also can know that our posture, we, we don't come to meditation always with um, an ability to sit in proper posture. Okay, some might argue that you might have a lot less pain if you sit in a proper posture. However, a lot of times people come to meditation wearing the scars of life in your body. You may have a bum hip, you may have a bum shoulder, um, low back, whatever. Okay, so you have to kind of find your way to sit in a way that flows energy comfortably. If you are sitting tense, that's not going to be comfortable. Right? She is not going to be flowing easily if you're just, oh my god, my pain, my pain, I can't believe this pain. Right? <laughs> so being able to find a way to sit in a chair, for example, instead of sitting in, if it's a wonky hip, it's a tight hip. Don't sit in, in, in on a cushion. It's going to be painful. Okay, so we sit in a chair, we sit in says we compensate. We try to listen. We ease up that pain, that tension around the hip. It doesn't get rid of the hip pain, but now you have a different relationship with it. Okay, so I hope that this stands to reason that this same awareness, that being aware of our bodies and, and, and how we feel, um, during our meditation greatly impacts our daily lives. If I'm dragging, I have to check how I'm feeling and see what's at the root. I mean, it's common sense, but it, it takes doing. Still, it, it, I mean, if, it, if it, 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 we become more keenly aware of our stress, it Instead of being overwhelmed by it, we can see ways of mitigating or handling it better, or just simply not have it have such command over you. That active process extends our extends to our relaxation as well. If we, we can go for a walk, but to be able to go for a walk, to breathe in the air, to see nature, to open the swing the arms, to open the gate, it, it it helps to open us up intentionally, purposefully, and in uh, and in actively. We we can recenter, refuel, and recharge, but it's in the doing. Our attention um, to our key activates, and our intention directs the key. If nothing else, allow this idea to become part of your meditative practice. But as, just as we sit on the cushion to see into the nature of reality, we can actively embody that homeostatic state, that balance, and that equanimity into our daily lives. Okay. Sorry to have run long there. I'll pause here. Um, and before I open it up, uh, don't suppose the Ishima sensei came on. Um, Munchin sensei, is there anything that you would like to... Uh, the only thing that I'd like to mention is that when you're talking about posture, um, there is the case where people are tense or whatever, and you, you, you see that. Where I'm sitting at, I actually look periodically around the room to get a feel for what the room is doing. And the biggest 
one of the biggest problems that I see is not tension. It's that people let their head flop down. They sit like this. Their shoulders are over, their head is down. It's like kinking the hose. Sometimes it's because you're falling asleep. Don't fall asleep. But that is probably one of the biggest things. If, if you were on Hiazon, we would walk around with the coke, with the coke side to, to straighten your back, pull your head up and all that. We'll do that during a retreat. Mm -hmm. But just to let you know that that's probably one of the biggest issues that I see mm -hmm. sitting where I am, mm -hmm. looking around the room. And, and just to hop on that, I, I, I use that example often um, as a, a sign of tiredness. As soon as we slump, our kidneys are weak, and so we start to cave, right? That's that caving ex example. So if our if our tendon is full and replete and we have upright key, then our spine is held and we're not getting that slumped posture. Um, anyway, so that's... Yeah, we only have a few minutes. Yeah. We only have time for one or two questions. Yes, any, any questions?